Welcome back to the Student Hub Live. Well, what did you think of that? Isn't that an amazing virtual reality app? Michelle, what are you up to? Well, you see the goggles, they are absolutely brilliant. If you're scared about presentations and you want to get in your bedroom and try these on and have a go with that, that's absolutely brilliant. So the app makes you feel like you're giving a presentation to real people. They react to you. They say to you, or they can walk out of the room, for example, if they think you're looking down too much or if you're mumbling or if you're not interactive. Do so they applaud at the end? They do applaud at the end as well. So you don't have to leave your bedroom to do a real presentation. It's absolutely brilliant. And they've got many other uses. There are loads of apps that you can download onto your phone that are virtual reality that you can use the goggles for afterwards, not just for educational purposes. Wow. And I'm not wearing these for the rest of the day. No, okay, fair <laughs> enough. I think you've got to give them back because they're an item on. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm glad you've enjoyed that. Okay, our next session um, is called A Sight for Sore Eyes. Um, and uh, I'm welcoming um, Dean Fletcher and Ben Mellowish. Um, now, you are, Dean, the Academic Conduct Officer <laughs> for, um, uh, for the faculty. Um, so why aren't you wearing a hat and looking a lot more official? <laughs> I just thought I'd dress it down and be nice and summery today for the rain outside. Oh, excellent. Now, you've prepared this fantastic session, um, which is basically talking about plagiarism, which yeah. is one of the things that students are very, very frightened of. But many will inadvertently... Um, do some sort of copying or, or taking ideas in some sort of way. And what we wanted to talk about in this session was understanding, I guess, um, we all don't want to plagiarise. We don't want to steal anything. You know, none of this is inadvertent, but it's very easy to sort of somehow end up um, sometimes taking things that aren't maybe your own. It is very easy and probably the biggest um, offender, if you like, is the person who inadvertently commits plagiarism. Yeah. Um, and often what that is is a lack of knowledge, particularly with yeah. people, new students um, in particular, coming specifically to the OU, having maybe not had a previous background in education or higher level education. Um, it is quite a skill that you need to get used to. And even at you know, traditional universities where it's, it's taught on a lot of modules, it's still something that can catch people out. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. The intention, of course, is, as you say, to you know, move students on and help them not to do that. Yeah. yeah. And Ben, um, you are a student experience manager um, for the Faculty of Business and Law um, and you're working with B100. So what we've done in this session is taken some neat ideas um, okay. to talk students through some of these um, these aspects. So on your screen, you're going to see you're going to see lots of widgets in this session, these interactive voting tools. Um, and you'll see some now. Would you take the umbrella for paying for it? And you see other people taking umbrellas without paying for them. Now, these are not trick questions. We genuinely want to know your opinion on things because this is a very subtle area. Um, so let's see our first case. So getting wet um, is the first example that we've had. Shall I read through this? Yeah. yeah. So the scenario is this. You head out to the shops on what starts to be a mild day. I mean, this is very typical for today, actually, which is pouring down outside, I think, still. Soon enough, the cold kicks in and the rain begins to fall. Wearing your shorts and T-shirts was a bad idea. In one of the shops, there are hundreds of umbrellas, which we can see modelled here. The shop has already sold hundreds of umbrellas that day and has made a handsome profit. You pick out an umbrella you like and are faced with some issues. And the issues are this. Would you take the umbrella without paying for it, uh, yes or no, and you see other people taking umbrellas for paying for them, would you do that now? Okay, so these are the questions that we would like you to vote on at home. This is one of these issues, I guess, that, um, that has to deal with corporations. You know, often if it was an individual, it's slightly different stealing from a grandmother with her only umbrella than a shop who maybe has a lot who's making a lot of profit. And when you see lots of other people doing it, are you more likely just to copy them and go with the trend, go with the flow and do what they're doing because they may be taking an umbrella without paying for it, but is that right? That's the discussion we're hoping students would have while they're trying to answer these quidgets today. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's very likely that a lot of people, well, I don't know. I mean, would you take the umbrella without paying for it? There's always the circumstantial aspect as well. You know, if it's raining outside, the, the, the need for that umbrella becomes greater. Yeah. Um, I personally wouldn't take it, no. No. But then I'm supposed to say that because I'm the academic condom. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> You're getting all sorts of trouble. You'll yeah. probably get a form. <laughs> so, um, so we asked people at home what they would say um, in terms of taking the umbrella without paying for it. Let's see what you had to say. OK, so no is 88%, but yes is 12%. OK, very honest of you. Thank you for that. Um, and what about when you see other people taking the umbrellas um, and not paying for them? What would you do then? Let's see. If you haven't voted on that, you can do that already. But 83% had said no. OK, so we've got a slight decrease there in the number of people saying, no, they wouldn't take an umbrella 
it without paying. So firstly, they said, no, they definitely wouldn't. But if they see other people, then there's a bit of an increase in the number of people who might because there's a decrease in the figures going down there. OK, so interesting point. Are we able to find out who these people are that would take it? No, and you can't email them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Getting likes. OK, this is another scenario. So we're going to put some more widgets on the screen here. Um, these are the questions. Would you edit the picture to delete the photographer's details and upload it to your Instagram page? You can see we're getting a bit more complex now. Uh, you've had an issue with captioning the photos. Here is a photo I took. And would you see an issue with not crediting the photographer? So this is all about a graduation at the OU, isn't it? Is this, is this a true story? It's not a true story, but it very easily could be a true story. <laughs> okay, so at your graduation from the OU, there is a photographer circulating and taking pictures that can be bought. I think this is a really common issue. And there have been a lot of graduations this week. The photographer uploads the pictures onto an album on the internet um, containing his name and his uh, details. You are liking one of the pictures of you um, and are convinced it will get at least 100 likes of Instagram. Um, however, the watermark of the photographer's details are ruining the picture. So the question is, would you then edit that picture to delete the photographer's details and upload it to Instagram, if indeed you could do such a thing? Um, and would you see an issue with captioning the photo? So here is a photo I took, or would you credit the photographer? Um, and would you see an issue with not crediting the photographer? Okay, so would you edit the photograph? 77% um, have said no, but 23% have said that they would. So that's nearly a quarter. Yes. Is that higher than you expected? It's about where I thought it would be. I think when people put a photo online, they don't always think it's, it's stealing because it's just a picture online and it's a picture of me, therefore... If I'm just going to take it and post it, really, what's the harm in me doing that? But we, we need to try and educate students and get them to think about, well, there is something wrong with that. And if you took that photo and if it was your livelihood, you would feel bad if someone was taking it away from you. Even so, though it's there in the first place. Even though it's there in the first place. So say I took the photo of Dean at his graduation and I was trying to sell it to him and then he just took it off my, on, off my online album and posted it as something he took himself. It, it, it's not right. It wouldn't sit right with me as a as a student or as an um, individual. And is there anything about editing this and sort of changing it slightly? The subtleties there with that, with the watermark. Well, the point of that is obviously nowadays with social media, etc., it's it's quite commonplace really to to be using pictures of yourself or, or things that you want to use yourself. Um, and if somebody else has somebody else has produced that, then. There's, there's every reason for you to use that as your profile picture, for example, and how do it how you want it, yeah. ultimately. Um, I think probably the balance here is that this, from the photographer's perspective, this is a product that he's advertising. You know, this is his business, for example. Just like when you'd go in the shop in the first scenario, yeah. there's an umbrella for sale on the stand. Yeah. Well, here, his stand is, is the social media platform, the internet. Yeah. Um, so there isn't really much difference there in terms of you taking that, whether you choose to edit it or, or not. You know, you, you could argue perhaps that editing it is perhaps going that step further to suggest that you are willfully, willfully and intentionally trying to mm. pass that off as your own mm. and, and take away any identity from the photographer. OK, so there's that issue and then there's also the captioning or the naming or, or titling. So we asked people, would they see an issue with captioning the photo and, and like saying, this is what I took. So basically sort of lying and saying that it was something that they took. Uh, let's see if we've got any feedback from that um, and uh, see what you had to say about that. We've also asked about not crediting the photographer as well. So if you haven't filled that one in, uh, do so now. 89% have said that they would see an issue with captioning the photo. So there's a bit of a difference here between sort of putting it on mm -hmm. and then saying who had or hadn't taken it. So a lot more people would post it, mm -hmm. but not lie about who took yeah. it. Yeah. OK. And then I guess we're going sort of down, down a path here. Would you see an issue with not crediting the photographer? So let's see what you had to say about that. 74% uh, said yes. That surprises me. OK. Well, that suggests that clearly if people are using the photo they would expect to say where that came from. Mm -hmm. HJ um, and Michelle, do you have some advice on this? Yes, we had, uh, actually, Graham's just commented saying that uh, digital rights is a big deal and you might end up getting a phone call because you never know with these sorts of things and some companies and people are very um, fastidious in following up on it. But um, there is always uh, online as well, we 
uh, just talking to Angela about Creative Commons and uh, usually um, they'll say if they're happy for it to be used and if you use things like Wikipedia, the photos on there, they'll say what you can use it for and whether you can use it on your own work and you have to say who it's by. So there's lots of helpful tools about to help you sort of navigate through what you can and can't use and it's just being aware of them and being sort of cautious I think and uh, I think Graham is right you want to avoid any phone calls on that front. And each photo is different so one photographer might have many photos but they might have one set of guidance for one photo and a different set of guidance for another photo so for each photo you do need to check out what is and isn't allowed. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so now we get to the, the nitty gritty, which is about um, assignments. OK, and we've been talking a little bit about this today. We don't want to terrify people, but here's our scenario. Now, you'll see that there are five widgets here, um, which we'd like you to fill in as you've been doing so. So the final TMA is due and you've worked tirelessly on it, being modelled here. Uh, you spent a lot of time attending classes, researching content and studying materials in order to achieve the score needed to help you achieve your target grade. So people have been setting their expectations, all very good. But a colleague, however, has not been able to produce the assignment and now asks you for your assistance. OK, so this is what we would like to know. The colleague asks you to use your assignment as a reference guide in order to then complete their own assignment. So would you let them? Yes or no? If the colleague had asked for your assignment to copy from, would you then let them? Or, unbeknownst to you, your colleague takes a copy of your work and then submits it as their own. Do you think it's acceptable? And if the roles reversed and you were the colleague in need of assistance, would you see an issue with taking someone's work? And the final one is it transpires that you and your colleague receive the same grade for a piece of work. Do you think that is fair? I mean, this sort of thing used to happen to me um, when I was studying because I met people at tutorials and we'd often talk about things and I'd often have someone on the phone going, I can't, because of course I was really diligent and like yeah. on time and every, always. Um, but, but sometimes there would be someone saying, I really can't deal with this, this and this. Sometimes I'd talk to people and sometimes, to be fair, it actually really helped me clarify in my mind what some of the points were. So I liked talking to other people about stuff. But, you know, th there are a lot of issues here about the extent to which that line can be crossed. It's happened to me as well. Um, so the best way I learn is through teaching. So I really like talking about what I'm trying to write about with someone else. Yeah. But I've had people ask me, oh, can I see what you've written for that, for that question or for that assignment? And maybe I can take some ideas from you or to see how you've structured it. It's a, it's a grey area whether you should or shouldn't show them this piece of work. As opposed to talk about it. As opposed to talk about it. Um, there's probably an addition to that as well in that it's in order to enable plagiarism is an offence also. So to what extent, if you, everybody chats and everybody discusses the TMAs or the assignments that might be due. And I think in principle there's not, not much wrong with that. The point at which you present your work for the student to do whatever that student chooses to do, whether you have an agreement that it's copying, using as a reference guide, whatever that may be. If they go ahead and ultimately copy it and essentially plagiarise, then the onus is kind of taken away from you. That's, that's their issue that they plagiarised, but your issue is the fact that you've allowed that plagiarism to occur in the first place. I think you'd avoid that by ultimately not providing anything. That doesn't rule out the fact that you can still have a discussion with students. And I think in some modules that will be encouraged, you know, to, to have that chat with fellow colleagues. But it's to the extent in which you are protecting yourself and ensuring that you're not going beyond what you should be doing within the student code. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's a really difficult one. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that we often think about with these cases is, would this happen at a brick university? You know, students talk. The fact that we're at a distance doesn't mean that we shouldn't be talking. And it's about the extent to which, you know, um, collegiate academic discussion is useful. And indeed, as you, you progress in your studies, it's increasingly useful, both to sound stuff out in your own head as well as um, to get other people's opinions. Definitely. It would help when critically analysing or looking at anything to discuss it with someone else that's studying the same subject or some same topic as you. It's just whether you want to share everything you're writing and yes. your opinion and your viewpoints on that or yeah. whether you just want to discuss your thoughts around a, a topic as opposed to what you're going to submit as your answer to that question being posed. Mm. Ultimately as well, if, if you are using words, phrases, assignments from fellow colleagues then you can avoid it entirely by referencing that. Yeah. Um, if I choose to use somebody else's work, and whether that is a colleague of the university, um, a student of the university, then I, I, I can do that, but I need to accredit that person being yeah. the source of that. Yeah. 
Right. So we've asked people about um, this whole situation and I've got all of the results here, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, so the first question we asked, which a colleague asks to use your assignment as a reference guide. So this is maybe where they're sort of... Helping each other out. Yeah, but not copying it. 12% um, have said that they would let somebody do that. Um, and 80, oh, no, we've changed a bit, actually. 11% and 89% have said no, they wouldn't. I, I mean... Is this, is this allowed? In the academic conduct, you're sort of comparing, you know, we, we have the software, which I want to come on to in a minute and things. Um, but is, is this legally allowed for students to sort of say, here's my assignment, have a look at it? Again, that's probably quite a grey area because it's the extent, if, if you're enabling plagiarism, yeah. as I said, which is an offence in itself, mm. then you, you might potentially open yourself up yeah. for an investigation. Yeah. Um, is it allowed to discuss ideas, discuss content? Then yes, of course. Um, it's getting that, that balance, I suppose, between what's considered going beyond what an ordinary discussion would be and to what extent now are you stepping over to go, here is my work, whether you want to copy it or not is up to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. OK, um, people were a little bit more clear cut on um, the other questions. If a colleague asked your assignment to copy, would you let them? 100% have said no. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so that's going to stop a lot. Unbeknownst to you, your colleague takes a copy of your work. Do you think it's acceptable? Again, 100% have said no. Um, if the roles were reversed and you were the colleague in need of assistance, would you see an issue with taking someone's work? And they've said yes. 100%. So they're clearly listening. Um, and then we've asked this question about grades, which I think is a really, really interesting one. It transpires that your work, um, that you and your colleague receive the same grade for the same piece of work. Do you think this is fair? And 31% have said yes, and 79%, or 71 actually, it's changed, have said no. There might be a balance there, because I suppose the fairness aspect is you want consistency when pieces of work are being marked. So yes. if, if I produced exactly the same piece of work as somebody yes. else, then I would want to ensure that we get the same grade. Yeah. Whether it's fair in a moral stance to say that, hang on a minute, I've done all the work and he's got the same grade as me, is perhaps where the 70% of people are. Absolutely. Um, because, of course, everything is standardised in terms of the way we mark. So markers have to mark to very strict, tight marking guidelines. And, of course, it, it would be that, you know, hopefully the same piece of work marked by different people, yeah. albeit by different students, should get the same grade because of the standardisation process. OK, um, so we've also asked, um, do you think you would complete plagiarism at the OU? And this is the, perhaps the most important part of this session. So can you tell people, Dean, what, how we sort of measure and track these things, not to scare students at home, because they're clearly not wanting to plagiarise, but so that they understand some of the processes and, and how we pick certain things up. And in particular, we've talked about stealing stuff, but also yeah. there's this issue that's more common, which is copying amounts of word, or just thinking, oh, they've written it so well, I couldn't possibly write it any better. I'm, I'm going to change every third word, and, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> and then it's not going to show up. Tell us about the systems we use and what happens. Uh, well, the first point to say is, as you've touched on there, that you know, from an OU perspective, we don't want students to play dry. So we're not here on a witch hunt to find people that are doing. You know, ultimately, we'd rather prevent that rather than cure it, as it would be. Um, but the OU use two pieces of software to detect it. Now, every single assignment will be run through these pieces of software uh, the day after the, the deadline for the assignment and four weeks later. So every assignment, whether it's late or early, is submitted through it and is detected. Um, there's the Turnitin software, which detects plagiarism in the sense that that will compare sources from the internet and any handbooks or U materials, for example. And there's Copycatch copy software, which detects any OU work that's been submitted previously. So the Turnitin will essentially detect the, the standard plagiarism, if you like, where people have used something from the internet and not referenced it correctly. The Copycatch software will detect anything where you might have used a friend's work who submitted the same paper last year and the Turnitin provides a report and a percentage of what content of that has been plagiarised and the same with the copycat software as well that will essentially show us a script of the student's assignment and every single word is highlighted in the colour so red for example is an exact match highlighted blue might be that that word is repeated like you said in word one and has now been replaced with word three for example um, the top and bottom of it is that if, if it has been copied or used from another source, it will be detected. Okay. And in terms of severity levels then, um, 
in your role as academic conduct officer, like you say, we're trying to often give students study skills and support um, because often it is inadvertent. Yeah. Um, but sometimes students might get a, an internet off the uh, an essay off the internet. Sometimes they might take a large chunk of stuff from Wikipedia. They might even reference that. But still, there are sort of study skills. But when does it get really bad that that an academic conduct officer might intervene? Um. Again, I mean, each case is taken on a subjective basis, really. It's very difficult to apply a blanket approach because a case, for example, that might have 50% plagiarism, when you review that, it might not be as bad yeah. as a 10% plagiarism case, for example. Yeah. And that might be down to things like the content of the work that is plagiarised. Yeah. If it's uh, reviewing a piece of material, that might not be seen as bad as a conclusion aspect of the assignment, for example, right. what, that is expected to be your own words. Yeah. Um, Equally, if you're a level two or three student, then you might be expected to have a higher standard than, than the, the new entrant level one student, for example. Um, but it's really, it's really difficult to say what, what would and wouldn't class as plagiarism. And we often get asked things like, you know, is there a particular percentage that is, yeah. will I get caught? Am I allowed 10%, for example? Yeah. Now, in theory, you know, you're not allowed anything. But again, on a case by case basis, there might be reasons why a particular percentage is, is, is more severe than another, for example. If you're including a lot of definitions or things, for example, that you need to quote, it might show. But the, but the point is, really, it's about the intention. If you deliberately go and nick your friend's work um, or take things or big ideas and write them down as if they're your own, as if you took that photograph, yeah. as if you, you know, have taken something that's not rightfully yours, that is fundamentally wrong. Um, and, uh, and then you'll have to fill in a form. <laughs> well, sometimes as well, you know, there's clearly attempts by students in some cases. We, we will read the assignment, so we see the report that comes through, but you compare that with the assignment itself. We're not just going off a report and seeing a percentage figure. Yeah. Some students, it's clear that they are trying to reference, for example, they're perhaps just not, not yeah. doing it correctly. Yeah. So a prime example of, OK, you need tuition, then an extra hour with your tutor, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in other instances, you might have students that, um, whether or not there's intent, which doesn't have to be there, it's clear that they are trying to use other other people's work and, yeah. and use it as their own, ultimately. Brilliant. Well, Dean and Ben, that has been a fantastic session. I've really enjoyed that. You've brought up some of the subtleties um, of this whole issue. Um, we asked at home whether or not you would plagiarise. Um, I think you've all said no, so that's good. Phew. Um, but, uh, but thank you very much for bringing to life this issue um, and uh, introducing us to some of the ways in which we tackle this at the OU. Lovely. So we are now going to show you a short video, um, which is the online library with Nicola Beer. Um, and then we're going to talk about being online and we're going to get online. So our next session is going to be um, about online rooms, which is the new OU's tutorial system. After that session, we're going to offer you the opportunity to come into the room and be online with Rob, who is going to be leading the next session. Now, you'll find the link to that on the website um, and also in the program, the abstract for the next session um, or the sort of listing for the next session, we'll have the link to that room. So you might want to get that set up in the break um, or you might want to watch this video, um, which is Nicola Beer in the online library. I'll see you in a few minutes.